just an instruction so that we can avoid the chat option and rely more on the Q and A to have some bit of a uh, you know concentrated uh, space where we can refer to the Q and A. So over to you, Mr. Dhawan. Okay. Good. Uh, good evening, everybody, and and welcome. Uh, my name is Christian Dhawan, and I chair the uh, FICI Task Force on ESG. Um, as a group, uh, our ambition is to uh, increase awareness of the uh, of the uh, issues uh, and concepts uh, in managing uh, companies uh, based on ESG principles, and really to highlight the imperative uh, that uh, ESG represents. Um, you know, it is far from an option anymore, uh, and is central to, to to business operations. And to that end, we um, do or try to organize uh, conversations uh, of relevance uh, uh, from time to time. And, and we're very pleased uh, today uh, to have with us uh, Professor C.B. Bhattacharya from the University of Pittsburgh Business School, uh, who recently uh, authored a book, which uh, uh, we will get into uh, in a few minutes um, on uh, related to this subject. Um, I think uh, Professor Bharacharya obviously brings a, a lot of his uh, uh, teaching and his international experience to the subject, and I think it would be very instructive for all of us to know how um, this subject is being perceived and practiced uh, across the world. Uh, in conversation with uh, Professor Bharacharya, uh, we will have uh, our, our colleague of ours from the uh, task force, uh, Amit Tandon, who is the founder and chief executive of the IIAS, the Institutional Investor Advisory Services, um, uh, and a company that uh, both preaches and practices uh, concepts uh, around EFG. So we look forward to a very engaging conversation and I'll turn it over to Amit. Uh, thanks a lot, Krishan. Uh, it's my job to introduce uh, CB to you. Uh, CB, as uh, Christian mentioned, is uh, Chair in Sustainability and Ethics at the Katz Graduate School of Business, University of Pittsburgh. He's been a well-known expert in business strategy innovation aimed at increasing both business and social values. And uh, his research actually focuses specifically on how companies can use uh, under leverage intangible assets, such as corporate identity, reputation, corporate social responsibility, uh, sustainability to strengthen uh, stakeholder relationships and drive uh, firm market value. Uh, I think there are a couple of things which uh, kind of uh, stand out uh, in his CV. One is the fact that he's been a part of the select group of faculty members that have been named twice to Business Week's outstanding faculty list. He's been recognized by both uh, Thomson Reuters and uh, Google scholars as one of the top cited scholars in his field. Uh, from the perspective of all of us, you know, far too long we're used to uh, people coming in and giving us a theoretical view about what's happening. Uh, but CB has actually conducted research and consulted for many organizations such as Allianz, AT&T, Bosch, Eli Lilly, uh, General Mills, uh, Green Mountain Coffee, Hitachi, Procter & Gamble, uh, Timberland, Unilever, some of all are uh, very big names. So that's the, uh, I guess, formal introduction to CB. There is also an informal introduction. Both of us uh, uh, were in uh, university together doing our undergra undergraduate degree, um, Delhi University from St. Stephen's College. Uh, I must say when we connected after all these years, uh, we do both have a different recollection of our time there. Uh, I remember him as uh, sitting in the front row while I was in the back row of the class, and he remembers me as uh, uh, sitting in the front row while he was in the back row of the class. So I guess we'll have to meet in person to sort that one out. But uh, meanwhile, I'm going to hand over the uh, screen to him. He'll walk you through a presentation, some of his learnings, uh, what he's seen companies doing in uh, different parts of the world, after which uh, we'll uh, throw it open to the house if they have any questions. So. Thanks, CB. Over to you. Have we lost uh, CB? Yeah, um, I can't see him in the panelist list. Okay. So. 
let's just let's, wait uh, maybe yeah, let's let's wait for a couple of minutes and he will uh, be back And so, Amit, uh, would you like to share with the group how long we expect the session uh, to last? Very roughly, what we've planned is that uh, we will have uh, CB speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so, after which we will uh, throw it open for Q&A. So uh, we've begun pretty much on time. So if, uh, you know, unless there's a there's a significant delay in CB joining. Uh, we should be able to wind up things at 6.30. That's what we are planning for as of now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharya has joined in again. Yeah, he's back. So. Yeah, he's back. My apologies. What happened? Uh, something happened. Shall I just take off? Sure, sure. We just finished introducing you, and uh, I said that we go back to 79. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, thank you, Amit. Thank you. I just went through a, a slightly harrowing experience of the Wi-Fi just dropping without announcement, just the way, if anything can go wrong, it will. Somebody said that at some point. Um, let me th start by thanking um, Mr. Dhawan and Amit for this warm introduction and to the Fiki um, colleagues for, for organizing this, this event. It's a, it's a great opportunity to talk to you uh, a little bit about my work. So um, just to drive, dive straight into it. I've been working in this space for about 25 years now, just trying to understand, you know, how companies can be effective social change agents. I mean, can companies actually operate in a space where they can do good things for society, good things for the environment, and kind of make financial value at the same time and derive financial value from those activities at the same time. And it looks like that that's indeed a possibility and it does happen in, in uh, practice for those companies who uh, understand the strategy of how to go about it. So my objective here today is to try to explain to you a little bit about how one mechanism through which kind of, you know, doing, doing good can also lead to kind of act doing well financially. Um, so let's start with a question, I mean, you know, so. Most of you out there are working in some kind of an organization. And um, if I came into you and I said, hey, would you like to lower your costs? Would you like to have higher revenue, profits, better reputation, higher employees, these things, right? I mean, so every, everybody is gonna, is gonna say yes. But so, so, well, yeah, that's great, but just, embed sustainability into your company's DNA. You know, just make caring for the planet, caring for the people, a part of your daily operations. You know, every business decision you make, if you make that through the lens of sustainability, I can promise you that you will get these returns kind of over uh, in, in, in due course. And then you'll all say, well, you know, that's, that's absolutely great. That's fantastic. Let's do it. But there's a little bit of a roadblock. And the roadblock is that sustainability, which is I simply defined as kind of the well being of our planet and our people, is viewed as quote unquote someone else's problem in most companies, right? Someone else's problem. So we have Amit Standen, I'm just giving, picking up one name, who's going to take care of our sustainability issues, you know? 
or we have Mr. X, Y, Z who's going to take, and that's, it's not, I have bigger problems to solve, budgets to kind of meet, targets to meet, this, that, whatever. In most companies, it's relegated to a single department. And even those companies who are willing to change from this situation to combat the major, major environmental issues that are kind of plaguing us uh, in, 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 in our companies, in our countries, in the world, even those who are willing to change, they don't know how to do it. So this kind of intrigued me. And for the last several years, I've been researching kind of, you know, what is it? What does it take for companies to actually make a difference to this kind of landscape where sustainability, our very survival, you know, and the very health of our companies, I mean, if that's being sidelined in the pursuit of profits, then something is wrong. And I, and I wanted to understand what was really going on, how can we make it better, et cetera. So over the course of about five years, I traveled the world, you know, uh, interviewed managers from, from several companies, uh, including from, from India, China, the United States, all of Europe, et cetera. And the one thing I learned during those interviews of, of these several companies said that, that those that are successful, those that are successful in, at sustainability, they really make it everybody's job in the company. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. Everybody has to pitch in and do whatever they can from the mailroom to the boardroom, whatever they can in terms of helping the environment in terms of helping society and not as an extra activity. This is baked into the business decisions that these individuals are, 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 are making. And so what did I learn? And that's what I want to spend five minutes uh, talking to you about. First thing I learned is that in many companies, there are these sustainability myths, as I call them, that impede progress. These beliefs that are not true, but people are just hanging on to these beliefs. First of all, is the belief that the purpose of business is to maximize profits. No, it's not. Don't anybody tell you that. The purpose of business is to actually create value for its stakeholders, for all its stakeholders, not just shareholders, for customers, for employees, for suppliers, for community members. And it is the creation of that value that actually results in profits. There's a big difference. So instead of chasing profits, we should be ch chasing value creation for all stakeholders. Sustainability is the next iteration of CSR. That's, that's a widespread belief, right? And <clears throat> what, what, what do we do with that? Well, it's not sustainability and CSR is not, is not the same thing. CSR is something that company does volitionally, you know, and that's perfectly all right to be relegated to a department. It's social responsibility, whereas sustainability is survival. And when it comes to survival, every department of the company matters from procurement, where are our products coming from, all the way through to disposal, where are our products going? So these two are not the same thing. The third myth is that my flights, flights froze. Um, there was a comment in the chat that the slides are minimized. Is there a way to make them bigger? Uh, I'm just writing back to him that uh, he can change the settings or view settings at his piece. Okay, uh, okay, okay. I'm just we, are, we, are, we are seeing the full, we are seeing the full side slide. So yeah. Okay, I can continue then. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Please so the third myth is that change management alone can fix sustainability. This also I have observed in many companies is that, hey, we can bring in Accenture or, or another change manage McKinsey company and they, they can like, you know, embed sustainability into our DNA. Not so fast, not so fast because sustainability actually goes to the philosophy of why a business exists in the first place. What is business purpose? Change management also only concerned about profits. And so we have to add this business philosophy part to change management if we want to use it to fix sustainability. And last but not least, sustainability is a cost. No, it's not. It's an investment. It's an investment in the future health of your company. And it will kind of give you returns 
um, if you do it correctly in the long haul. So what does this model actually look like? What I observed in these companies that I visited was that one thing that was palpable, you know, that I could absolutely feel it in the air was this idea of ownership amongst employees. Every employee took ownership of the idea that sustainability was his or her problem, right? And I came back and I started looking at this literature on ownership and said, so what is this ownership? And I learned that this Psychological ownership actually refers to feelings of possessiveness that you have towards an object, a person, a company, even an idea like sustainability. Kind of, oh, okay, I own the sustainability of my company. And every person to, to, to a person believes that they own the sustainability that they of their company, you know, and ultimately of the world, and we'll get there. And why is this a powerful idea? It's a powerful idea because ownership is part of the human condition. Jean-Paul Sartre said something to the effect of, we are what we have at some point. And finally, ownership is an extension of the self. So we like to show it as part of our identity, you know. So ownership is a, is a, is a strong concept to apply to the concept, uh, to the uh, context of sustainability. And, and that's what I did and came up, sorry, it's going the other way, uh, came up with this, a simple model that essentially breaks out, you know, the steps that a company has to take to become more sustainable into kind of three phases. And these are called incubate, launch, and entrench. And I'm gonna spend a minute perhaps and then stop um, so that we can get on with some discussion. But the, the phases are important in that if you do not kind of follow them in a certain order at least, then you're not gonna get the benefits. So let's see what, what, what kinds of uh, logic we are looking at here. And the first step is the most important step. And if we don't get this right, nothing else will follow. And that is that you have to define your company's purpose. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? Do we sell cars or do we provide mobility? There's a world of difference between those two. Do we sell electricity or do we empower people with what electricity can do for them? Two very, very different issues. So I learned from the CEO of this company called Enel, who is actually, it's the largest renewable electricity company in the world today. But, you know, he was wondering why they were putting a power plant in the Middle East when there was really no need for it or as, as he looked around. And then he learned that the idea was that they would put the power plant to make air conditioned tents in the middle of the desert so that the nomads of the area would, would congregate in these air-conditioned tents and sit down and watch TV. And he said, none of that made any sense to me because that's not the job of an electricity company is not to foist new habits on people, but it's rather to help people do what they want to do. So he said, that was the moment I realized what is the purpose of an electricity company. Similarly, each of you in the crowd or on the audience today have to ask kind of, you know, wh why, what, what, what are we doing? What is the societal benefit my company provides? Remember, we talked about that value creation. So that's going to drive that value creation. So what is the value that we're trying to provide? And can we inspire epiphanies? Can we inspire epiphanies of CEOs, middle managers, rank and file employees to kind of see the light of that kind of, so life boy, a soap that's very dear to our heart that you all know about, you know, life boy's purpose is to help a child reach the age of five. So it's no longer like just an antibacterial soap, but what does it do? It saves lives. And when an employee believes that the company that he or she works for saves lives, makes products that saves lives, it's a very, very different feeling. I can tell you, having traveled widely and worked widely with Unilever, that they have internalized the sense of, you know, that they're actually helping society by, by their products. And that's important. You also have to define what's material for your business. So everybody doesn't have to run after carbon. It could be carbon, it could be water, it could be waste. It could be community development. But what is material? And there's a, a whole science on material, materiality analysis that I'm not going to go in with you right now. But every company should define two, three, four issues at the most that they care about and then cascade that list to all their employees after they've defined their purpose. So... Once you've defined your purpose and defined material issues, 
it's the launch phase and, and your job is to empower your stakeholders. Now, what does that mean? It means that we entice or seduce our employees basically to act sustainably and say, hey, you know what? If you kind of can minimize the use of this material, not only will we need less of the material, we will also be saving money. So you can appeal to the head saying, it's not only the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. And these appeals, you know, so Apple, that's what I learned from the environmental director at Apple saying, that's the most fun part of our business is when we can go and tell in our managers that, you know, it's not just the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do. You'll save money. And they love it when they, when they kind of figure out that this is also a way for them to reduce costs. But it's not enough to create willingness. You have to create ability. And what does that mean? It means that you have to train your, your employees. You have to install management systems so that they can do uh, their work becomes easier. So overall, the idea is we lower the costs of acting sustainably, right? So things happen at the push of a button by installing management systems and for, by you being trained. At the same time, we increase the benefits of acting sustainably by incentives. We can give financial incentives. We can give psychological incentives like, like promotions, awards, all of that. And as I said before, the idea is to make sustainability everyone's job. And then finally, the last step, entrench means to make routine. How can I make it second nature? Most of us by now, do, you know, don't forget to brush our teeth when we get up in the morning or, you know, put off the light when we leave a room. How can we make acting sustainably, being friends to the environment and to society, part of our nature, second nature? And for that, I have a bunch of steps, like most of all, like communicating the progress that we are making. Everybody loves to kind of know that they're making a difference. This is human psychology at folks uh, at work, folks. You want to co-create solutions with your employees to kind of make them the stars. Right? So, so it's not about you, it's about them. It's they that were doing it. Celebrating success and failure. So I have here a picture from Marks and Spencers and their thing is called Plan A, their sustainability plan. And they have award ceremonies every year calling out people at, at a store level who have gone the extra mile in helping their community or, or done something phenomenal at, you know, kind of uh, from their place of work. All of these help to kind of, you know, entrench or make second nature uh, sustainability in the organization. And the final part of entrench is to elevate your ownership from your own company level to the industry level. So expanding that idea of sustainability ownership. So you want to collaborate with competitors, right? Build platforms. So Unilever, the example I put up here, has worked very hard on deforestation, for example, you know, removing palm oil from the supply chain because that's kind of, you know, that's something that really adds to global warming. And successful companies have learned to put sustainability in the pre-competitive space. So let's not compete on saving the world. Let's compete on how to do better in the market, but let's leave this part kind of, you know, uh, aside and let's collaborate on sustainability. So these are some of the elements of the book. And I won't read these quotes, but the ownership in action is something wonderful to watch. I mean, you know, so here's the chief sustainability officer of a big retail company who's telling me some of the great leaps and breakthroughs with sustainability have happened because people across the organization have been inspired to change things themselves without coming to me to ask for permission, right? If a 100,000 person organization, if every time they have questions on sustainability, if they have to come to the chief sustainability officer, then things are not gonna move far quickly enough. And this person has the confidence. He says, they know they're part of the business better than me. And they are empowered to it tells me that, you know, we have an employee who decides that he can make changes to a valve, save energy, save water, add all of those up, you get a very big difference. And that's the essence of small actions, big difference. So I said this idea of doing well by doing good or the million man march. So, you know, we know many hands make light work. All of these phrases are correct. You know, we need all hands on deck, same thing. So all I want to say is that folks, there is a way where we can, as a business, create social and environmental value, think of the environment, think of society and implement our plans accordingly. And that in turn 
can drive your financial value as well. So this is what is called as the triple bottom line of people, planet, profit. And it is, there are lots of studies today to show that this is eminently achievable if you have the right kind of, if you have the right strategy. So I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop here. I just wanted to note before I stop that small actions, big difference is actually available in India. There is a special Indian edition of the book and you do not have to pay $40, but it's actually uh, 995 rupees. It's available on Amazon India. And I believe the, the distributor's name is Muki and Sons. Uh, by all means, if you have any trouble finding it, let me know. My vitals are as well here on this page if you want to connect. Um, but I, I stop here. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Krishan, for the opportunity. And uh, happy, to, happy to take questions here. I'll stop sharing, OK? Yeah, please post the link of the book. I will do that. Amit, are you around? <clears throat> Does anybody hear me? Yeah, no, we, you can, we can hear you. Um, CB, I, I, I'm not sure what's, what's happened to, um, to Amit uh, Nidhi. Any, any sense of what's happened? I'm just checking over phone, sir. OK. Um, so while uh, Amit, uh, we find Amit, uh, uh, CB, may I start with, with a question? Absolutely, you go for it. So I was very intrigued um, at your official um, sort of designation as a professor of sustainability and ethics at the business school. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which is which is uh, not a common sort of I think uh, combination or description. Uh, at least I haven't come across it too often. So um, this often comes up in the in conversations around sustainability, um, and I think you alluded to it. I, I, are we dealing with a, a business imperative or an ethical uh, choice when we, we when we uh, as 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 business people when we look at this issue? I mean it's. It's, it's, it's both. I mean, today, a business, it is a business imperative in that many companies are not going to be considered if they do not meet certain sustainability criteria, you know, in their, uh, in their, in their uh, sustainability report, in what they're, you know, kind of giving in terms of their product specifications. So, you know, for just for the sake of business, people will have to engage in them even if they don't care about what that is the right that is the right thing to do so that so there is both a normative part to it and there is an instrumental part to it so there is this belief amongst fewer companies perhaps that it is the right thing to do i mean we, you know what are we, what what are our children going to do what you know what, what's the future look like all of that but you know it's it's the bulk of the people are being moved via the pivot of uh, look i mean if we don't do this we are we are, we are going to be out of business very soon so 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 that's where the sustainability and ethics so that's where the kind of you know both the right thing and the smart thing kind of you know come together um to give you a little bit of a background it was the position that i, that I got headhunted for was actually you know originally for ethics but i just walked in saying that's that's not really what my, my scholarship is not much about ethics. It's much more about sustainability. And uh, um, so, but there is a logic that connects the two. The fundamentally, there is a logic that connects the two for sure. Okay, thank you. So I think Amit, Amit you're back. Would you like to uh, yeah, take over? I, I, yeah, I'm back. And, uh, you know, today's one of those days when I guess I got out of the wrong side of the bed. So first, uh, just before CB was to begin his, uh, wireless kind of started playing up and I had the same thing just now, but look, uh, Hey, thanks a lot for that. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know how many of you know, but, uh, you know, CB was teaching, uh, uh, and focused on statistical models for marketing. And then he met Ben Cohen, who's the founder of Ben and Jerry, who asked him that, look, I'm doing uh, so much for, uh, the environment and so much for society. Does it help me sell more ice cream? So that was the pivot which CB saw 
which changed things for him. But uh, uh, let me kind of come to a small, you know, there's thing in your, uh, in your presentation which resonated a lot with me, which you've said that, look, it's someone else's problem. So, you know, you kind of look at the smaller companies who say it's the problem of the larger companies. The larger companies say it's the problem of the government. The governments say it's the problem of, you know, the Western government. <laughs> Uh, other governments. So just walk me through in terms of, uh, you know, this and then how you kind of go from that to the individual in the, you did speak about it, but I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more about uh, this aspect of how it's each individual's responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, it, it's each individual's responsibility because we each inherit the earth. And if we don't understand that we are a renter, a visitor, however you describe it, but we are not the owner of the earth. We are not the owners of, the, of this earth. So it, it belongs, to, if, if it belongs to anybody, it belongs to the generation who will come after us. So there is a saying that I like very much. We do not inherit the earth from our parents. We actually borrow it from our children. And you know that, that's the sentiment with which kind of every person has to be kind of told or talked to the, the, the just as much as you take care of room where you sleep in, um, you know, you, you take care of your part of the planet Earth. And, and instead of like, you know, designating that room as the only place you live, it's like, okay, you help help the environment in the best in the best way you can. So in your personal life, you do the things that are helpful to the planet. In your professional life, you do the things that are helpful to your planet. So the idea of, of someone else's problem and the, the danger of someone else's problem is that it's very easy to pass the buck, right? I mean, it's very easy to pass the buck. It's very easy for a CEO who's come into a company to say, it's the next CEO's problem. I'm 60 years old and this is my last four or five years and I'm just going to rake it in and maximize shareholder value. I'm paid in stock options. That's it. And then, you know, that that's why we are in this mess because nobody has picked up the baton and made it their personal responsibility. So all, all I'm saying is that, look, if we can instill this sense of personal responsibility into employees of organizations, that's not a bad place to start because employees also have families and these employees will go home and talk to their children and their wives and husbands, whatever, and inculcate these practices also on the, on the home front. And that's where, that's how kind of this whole business of sustaining climate change, inequality, what have you, is going to be able to spread its standard. So it's, it's just why, you know, governments, I mean, the regulators have failed. I mean, they've failed. But maybe the individual is not going to fail. Maybe we can try to actually kind of inspire people. And you go to you go to some of these companies like Unilever and and, and L, and, and I'm sure that you know, there's other companies uh, as well. I visited um, um, Ambuja, Ambuja Cement in, in Mumbai. And they were doing an amazing job of, you know, calculating value to society and this like this. So, so there's lots of good work going on. And this was just, this is just one more attempt at kind of, you know, uh, at, at, at attacking, attacking the problem saying, okay, is, is this one, is this a viable way to skin the cat or not? I believe it is. And I've, Research to show empirical research, quantitative research, the kind uh, institutional advisors might want to look at, showing that purposeful companies, you know, are more sustainable. Kind of, you know, their 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 employees are more energized to work on sustainability issues than companies without purpose. For example, I mean, so it's uh, it, 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 you can follow the money, and and what everything I said today actually leads to money at the end of the day. If that's what you're interested in, but a nicer form of money, I guess. Okay. So, uh, uh, CB, there's a question from Mudit Sharma in the audience, and uh, this relates to, uh, you know, what you said, which is that uh, companies which focus on sustainability, uh, they are more, they have more robust operations. So, do you see some kind of um, attribution bias in the ESG-linked companies doing better in the, at least in the stock markets? Uh, uh, and do you actually see better, uh, you know, and you did refer to the fact that, uh, you know, it doesn't have necessarily come at the cost of the bottom line. So have you seen uh, work to the effect that, look, they have, uh, they're more profitable or it's, uh, or when you say it's more sustainable, profits are more sustainable 
uh, how do you kind of refer to that or what do you exactly mean by that and what should the uh, companies take home so essentially what we are showing or what i was trying to show in this last two by two uh, slide that i showed is that the creation of social and economic value can drive the creation of financial value so whether it's top line or bottom line so whether it's kind of increasing sales it can increase sales. so if i you know if i'm an environmentally friendly company and i have like a climate neutral certification you know com consumers might buy my products and so my my you know so it's possible that my sales are going to go up if kind of I get recognized as, as one of the most sustainable companies in one of these lists that Fortune or someone else puts out, my reputation gets ratcheted, I can hire better employees, I can get capital at a lower cost. So there's research that actually shows that companies that are more sustainable can access capital at you know, more favorable rates than companies that are not. So it's not one kind of dimension of financial value either. It's multiple dimensions that are working in tandem, you know, in, in, in synergy to kind of drive kind of the overall uh, profitability of the firm. And I thought what you were referring to uh, when you started speaking was the issue of causality. So, so is it that good companies invest in ESG or is it that ESG makes a company, ESG investments make a company better? That's a very, very good question. And there is causality, obviously there's this feedback loop of, you know, kind of, okay, I do good and I make more money then I have more money to spend on this. But when we do empirical research, we, we, we kind of adopt methodologies to make sure that the causality is, is, is kind of addressed and that the causality is not from, that the good company is investing. And there are econometric ways of, 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 of taking care of that. And we can follow longitudinally. We follow companies longitudinally, like companies that are better in sustainability, companies that are not so good in sustainability. Follow them over 20 years. And there's research actually that has done that. And then showing that even though they started from a similar position, profitability wise, 20 years later, the more sustainable company was more profitable. So there's enough, there's enough research to show the causality of that ESG drives profits. And at the same time, there's enough research to show that it's not just profit, but where is it coming from? So all the kind of the gains in the cost, the, the increase in sales, the increase in reputation, the increase in employee loyalty, all of these things kind of, you know, work synergistically to improve the bottom line performance of the firm. Okay, thanks. So very clearly, uh, one of the things which uh, I hear you're saying is that, you know, it is for the individual. What it means is it's not just for the large companies, but also for the small companies and SME. It's something which everyone should be focusing on. The other uh, takeaway which I've had from a couple of uh, your observations and comments is the fact that, you know, uh, and I, I'm kind of... It, I, I'll kind of uh, paraphrase what you said. One is the fact that you know CSR is not uh, corporate sustainable, uh, you know, sus uh, corporate social responsibility. Just like sustain, uh, you know, uh, focus on the environment is not uh, corporate sustainability. It's kind of, uh, you know, as a term, it's kind of come to meet uh, uh, to mean something different, which is that uh, uh, you know, uh, companies need to be behaving differently and doing something which is. Uh, taking into account the interest of all these stakeholders rather than one. So here's another question which uh, Krishan Jindal has asked. So is there an index or is there a measure which you can use or uh, is it that you have to kind of at this moment touch and feel your way through uh, sustainability and which are the more sustainable companies and which are less so? Um. Well, that's, <laughs> there's enough re, uh, disagreement amongst reviewers on, on those ratings. So there are environmental, you know, social and governance ratings. You can rate companies. So there is a, a <coughs> excuse me, um, there is a database called Asset4, for example, that actually asks companies kind of a variety of questions on ESG and then kind of you can score companies that are kind of doing better uh, on multiple dimensions versus those that are not and there are many and asset four is just one I mean there are many others companies you know kind of that 
are trying to kind of classify or, or rank ESG uh, performance of or, or rate ESG performance of different companies. Um, the problem becomes when kind of there's review or disagreement. So kind of you know when when it's middle of the road measures kind of things that companies are doing. It's easier for reviewers to agree that it's sustainable if it's something really innovative where people disagree. If it's a longer term investment into some some nascent technologies, reviewers might disagree on on the kind of sustainableness of that particular thing. So that there there it becomes uh, there it becomes difficult. But for 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 most of us, for for standard cases, yes, absolutely. I mean, you can look at. Uh, ESG ratings that are published uh, by, by by companies, uh, even people like Fortune, I think, publish you know rankings of of uh, companies that are more or less sustainable. You don't have to grope your way. I mean, you can you for in an individual company. I think the strongest measure I would propose is employee engagement. You will find that you know without even having to go outside to to get any other uh, third party certification. If you do a survey, if you invest in sustainability initiatives strategically, follow the materiality, follow the purpose, uh, you know, everything that I was saying in terms of the model, if you unfold that model a year down the road, I, you know, I would take a pretty good bet that your employee engagement is going to go up because employees find meaning in the company's operation suddenly, which meaning is lacking otherwise. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Tandon, if you allow me, uh, Mr. Sudarshan Sain, who's part of Fiki's Trust Assets Committee, is a former ED of RBI. He's raised his hand. Uh, if you allow me, can I unmute? Uh, please, Sudarshan, over. Sudarshan. Uh, Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya, thank you. Uh, Amit, thanks a lot, too. Um, well, uh, you know, let me just wear my former regulator hat for a minute. Um, you know, what we see is that the global, uh, you know, the financial regulation standard setting bodies like the Basel Committee, uh, they t tend to be focusing more on the risks to the safety and soundness of financial institutions and the financial system that emanate from climate change. It's like a defensive posture really. Uh, whereas they don't seem to be focusing on how can, and as I strongly believe must, the financial system mitigate risks to the environment in the manner of its lending. Uh, you know, we need to have frameworks for that. But nobody seems to be looking at that uh, holistically. But do you see evidence of that? Because what we see increasingly is a defensive position of how financial institutions can protect themselves against uh, the you know, environmental risk. But the fact is finance causes environmental risk. And that is an area which nobody seems to want to touch at a standard setting level. Yeah, well, and that's a great, uh, that, that, that's a great question, uh, Mr. Sen. I mean, I think I, I have a slightly different tack on it. Yes, you're right. I mean, of course, they're first trying to save themselves, but the only way to save themselves is by changing their lending practices, right? I mean, so recently we heard a lot of companies, at least in a lot of noise, I don't know if there's, a, you know, if rhetoric has translated into action, but how, or, you know, kind of financial institutions would be more careful in kind of who, who they lend their money to. And that, for example, they're not gonna invest in fossil fuels anymore. You know, uh, and and there are people like you know J.P. Morgan and all who who said that. I don't. I if you look at their portfolios, they're still holding uh, tons and tons of, of of money in those fossil fuel companies and and in the coal industry and so on. But their talk is that by 2040, by 2030, whatever, they are gonna they they they're gonna divest. Here is the problem, I, the way I see it. the problem is that they do not have a purpose, they have not found a purpose. Financial institutions still define their purpose in terms of making money. And unless, you know, financial institutions can figure out that they have this job of safeguarding, you know, the world, not safeguarding themselves, but actually through their lending practices, you know, they, they have a job of, of protecting uh, its citizens, their customers, all of them, uh, from from the devastation of climate change, things will not change. 
you know, unfortunately, I mean, so it's okay to have this postures that they have today. It's okay to have the conversations that they're having today, but it's nearly, it's nearly not enough is what I would say. And where it loses, where, where the disconnect is, is in that valuable realization of why do we do what we do? And this is the part that's, I think, really hard for, you know, business to get that it's not about making money. The problem is that the narrative of making money comes from Milton Friedman's time, you know, from the 1960s and 70s. So we have just perhaps in the last 10 years started talking about this whole business kind of look, it's not about making money, let's move away from this. Larry, Larry Fink has started writing about this for the last five years. So I would say, you know, let's, let's give it another five, 10 years and see if this narrative shifts or not. But we all got to work on it together. It's not going to happen on its on its on its on its own. Um, that that's that's all I can say. There are things like the equator principles that actually do kind of come into project financing these days. You cannot lend to just anybody unless they show you their environmental assessment report. This that, but those are still far far below or or, or lower requirements than what you are probably looking for. And those requirements will only come into place or that vigilance will only come into place when financial institutions are able to define their purpose and look themselves in the eye and figure out why they're doing what they're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ibi. There's a lot of debate in India going on, yeah, which has just begun in terms of what is the role of the central bank, because we've seen the uh, securities regulator focus a lot in terms of the reporting requirements. The central bank has kind of not been so vocal about some of these things. So it will be good to kind of uh, figure out, A, what is the role of the central bank? And is there something like a green central bank or not? Um, let me kind of come to one of the things which you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, so one thing is very clear that as uh, investors and other participants focus a lot on uh, sustainability, sustainable finance, uh, the company's business strategy, and you want the uh, sustainability to be embedded in the business strategy, it becomes a competitive advantage which companies have. Uh, so that's one part of the equation. On the other hand, you kind of say that, look, it's one planet which we are all uh, in, it's one country which we are, it's in one uh, you know, uh, neighborhood which we are all operating in, and therefore, uh, if you kind of, uh, rather than keep it as uh, something which is proprietary to you, uh, if you kind of share it as a public good, it's going to be a lot better. So just how are companies thinking about uh, what they do? Do they see it as uh, something which is uh, a competitive advantage or do, you see, do they see it as a public good? And uh, if they're seeing it as uh, something which they own, what is it which what will it take to make some of these things public good so that there's wider acceptance and more people are following uh, some of those policies and processes see if it if it has to be a public good so, uh, when it's a competitive advantage it's it's very much in the realm of the corporation and corporate philosophy etc when it comes to the public good there's debate as to whether companies should kind of actually, you know, infiltrate into the area of, of creating public goods or whether that's kind of the government's domain or not. If you talk about, you know, like parks and, and gyms and, and, you know, training centers, whatever, unless the company has, uh, in, through its materiality, found that those things are important for, for, for its betterment. Because there is a sentiment that companies should not kind of uh, Rome, where governments kind of, you know, uh, which is traditionally the governmental area. So now so, let, let, yeah, let me rephrase it. So therefore, let's say that, you know, someone's got a really good packaging solution, which is reducing waste by 25, 30%, or they're consuming less plastic. Should they then not? I got uh, you. I got you. Good? I got yeah. you. I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and there, it's, it's, uh, there are companies that believe in open innovation that, that actually share their, their technology with others saying, okay, you know, just uh, he, he, this is on an open platform. So, so when Unilever came up with a deodorant, uh, you know, the compressed can deodorant, so it uses less aluminum, it's the same amount of deodorant, but uses less aluminum. So, you know, it saves money, but it also saves basically a precious metal. Um, they made that innovation on, on an open platform. Many such like 
innovations are now cold water washing this that have become industry standards you know uh, although they were the innovation of one one particular company that, and that's the whole idea of kind of you know is this about competitive advantage i understand your question now much better and i think it's a fantastic question so is this really about competitive advantage or you know should this be for the betterment of all it do, it kind of boils down to the philosophy of the organization and there are organizations that will guard that technology for themselves and there will be organizations that make it available for the others so so there is really no no one right no one right answer at this point in time what we absolutely want more and more companies to share saying collaboration is the only way forward i mean look at what happened to the vaccine and the timeline by which the vaccine was produced it wouldn't have happened had there not been a lot of collaboration amongst a lot of partners so collaboration is definitely the way the, the the way to go forward so don't compete on the methodology that's what we were saying don't compete on the on the thermometer compete on the temperature you know so compete on what's actually happening going to happen in the marketplace you can do better than better uh when it comes to marketing that 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 that's fine but share the technology okay uh we yeah. have time for uh, one or two more questions so there is uh uh just hang on there was something on uh cop 26 and uh, you know the climate conference which is taking place do you have any specific expectations from that and what should uh, Uh, companies expect coming out of there will it be a more stringent do they kind of enter a more uh, uh, more stringent regulatory regime where you know they're going to uh, look at zero uh, carbon a little bit earlier than anticipated or are you do you think that the timelines which are there are going to stay for the foreseeable future so companies can pace themselves uh, on what they're going to be doing so this is uh, Uh, I can't having, read the name. I having, can't. Having, the, yeah, I can't read the name who's asked this question, but yeah. I mean, to be honest, I mean, having having observed uh, several cops so far, I mean, I'm I'm not optimistic that anything big is going to happen. I mean, I'm sad to burst everybody's bubble here, but you know, uh, typically countries get caught up in their own interests, and and so. unless india and china are on board and you know kind of are are willing to make sacrifices others will not follow them any others who are probably waiting on the fence and you know uh, to see what they do and and i think they probably will not agree to anything different than what they've already kind of agreed to and 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 this is what separates i think the company domain from this kind of cop domain where it's a mishmash of regulators corporates all kinds of people within the company i mean it's much it's a much clearer kind of uh space to to observe and act, and act in that okay if i do this on my own not only will my employees be happier my customers be happier you know everything be good I will also make them. You've suddenly uh, frozen. I uh, I guess today has not been a good day as far as technology is concerned. We've all had our challenges. uh let's wait and see when uh, cb gets back there are a couple of minutes more uh what i'm going to do is i'll just kind of pop up his uh okay so i've just got uh, sorry we've lost him i had uh, i was going to ask him one final question with regard to uh, you know is there an indian ah you're back hi i'm joining by phone if i'm here now 
Yeah, so, so I, I said I'm very mindful that it's close to 6.30 India time. We promised everyone that we'll kind of let them peel away then. I have your, uh, you know, since you disappeared, I thought I'd put up uh, the screen with your face and contact so that <laughs> anyone wants to reach you. Uh, but look, I have one last question of you, which is the fact that, you know, you worked with companies around the globe. So should there be an Indian specific philosophy uh, or approach to this? Or is there, you know, one global view which we should all f uh, follow? And, you know, if there is one India specific view, uh, should Fiki, should, can we get Fiki to champion that uh, with Indian companies going forward? Any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you actually look into ancient Indian literature, sustainability is very much mentioned in the Vedas. Um, you know, kind of the whole idea that we are renters of the planet. This is not. This is not new, and therefore, you know, it is our job to protect the planet, to take care of people, etc. So you can find any number of roots uh, in in Indian philosophy you know, in ancient Indian scriptures that, that actually appeal to this, uh, the fundamental principles of sustainability. So, and, and I think if, if there is anything uh, specific to, to, to India, it, it, it really is this idea of kind of, why do we do what we do? This idea of purpose, I think Fiki can help a great deal because that's where I believe the bottleneck is. Fiki can do a great deal by, uh, instituting a, a number of workshops, for example, on, on helping companies realize kind of what, you know, what, what, their, what their purpose is and kind of take that visioning into back into companies and cascading it to their employees. I think that will do a lot more. And, and if that can be couched into kind of some of that Indian philosophy and the literature and sustainability that I was talking about, um, that, that would definitely resonate you know, resonate a lot uh, more with, with the Indians because you're going to tie that to uh, something that's been around for generations and now we are just reviving this idea and, uh, and, and, and promote this idea of corporate purpose in, in that uh, kind of, in, 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 in that way. I think that can go a long way to pivot companies towards, uh, to, towards being more sustainable. And if there's any traction in that regard, uh, this is my life's passion, so I'd be happy to, you know, uh, help out in any which way I can. Uh, so I'm sure uh, Fiki will reach out to you. So it's quite interesting, right, from our ancient texts to, you know, if you go back uh, 100 years, uh, maybe a little bit longer, you find that, you know, corporate philosophy, uh, philanthropy and certainly uh, family philanthropy has played a great role. And I'm kind of here in Bombay and I kind of look around at a lot of what is around me. Uh, uh, and you kind of, whether it's a hospital, institute of social science, or even the zoo itself, you find that it's uh, private philanthropy, which kind yeah. of uh, went on to build that. And now we are kind of entering the next phase. Uh, I, I, and, you know, in a sense, it's at the right time because, you know, we haven't had the kind of excesses which we've seen with the Western world or China. So India can be a lot more positive in it. And there's a role for, as you say, for each uh, company and each individual to play. And of course, uh, Fiki here has kind of taken an initiative with the ESG task force and uh, holding, as you say, I'm sure they've been holding master classes, they can hold workshops and get a more engaged uh, set of uh, corporates and members who kind of help address this challenge uh, in a more meaningful way going forward. So. With that, I'm going to thank all of you for uh, taking a time off and hearing uh, CB. It's been wonderful uh, chatting with you and uh, uh, and uh, may I, may I request Mr. Dawan to let me, uh, yeah, let me uh, hand it over to Krishan to uh, say you. the closing remarks. Thank you, Krishan. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're on mute, Mr. Dawan. All right, sorry. Uh, thank you, CB. Uh, it was an excellent session. I just want to echo what Amit said. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing your, your insights and your experience with us. And I think a lot of what you said resonated very strongly. Um, I think the, the final points we're making around purpose and your kind offer to assist, uh, I think we you know, hopefully can take you up on that uh, at a future time. 
And we hope uh, the world normalizes enough for you to uh, visit and uh, that we can even meet, uh, meet with you in, in Delhi when you're, next, uh, when you're next around. So, so thanks again. And thank you for the, uh, to all the participants. Uh, as always, there's more questions than we have time uh, to, 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 to deal with, but thank you for the interest. And uh, you know, we hope to build upon this conversation uh, as uh, at the task force and see you know how best we can help uh, our members to to take this agenda forward. So thank you again, everybody, and have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye, Amit. Bye.